Welcome to CSL's fourth webinar. Thank you for joining today. We have a live Q&A, so please use as we proceed through. We also have a guest speaker, uh, David Davis from PBS, who will be uh, performing a live um, uh, video showing um, thermal imaging and uh, temperature sensing and some other um, uh, deep learning video analytics. So um, look, there are many new changes faced by the fire and security sector. In fact, all sectors of our communities and uh, business communities are being faced with huge challenges. But with these challenges uh, comes opportunity. We've seen a huge rise in what we call different business. Retail schools, workplaces mean people counting, social distancing on top of security. Man guarding is thriving. It was even mentioned by the Prime Minister a couple of nights ago. But it's not always good. COVID death rates are high in this sector. Uh, we must acknowledge where tech can replace um, frontline human vulnerability. Uh, our technology will be the power behind most strategy to overcome these important issues. I'll outline some problems in this section and then John Coleman will provide product solutions next. I want to fo focus on three key areas, BC All IP, retail comms, uh, using our router and fire and en54 bt all ip completes in 2025 it's not very far away work is accelerating at exchange and core level it's time for installers to evaluate their estate on pstn signaling upgrading from pstn to wireless has many other benefits apart from obsolescence, uh, reducing risk and reputational damage for one thing. If your systems aren't working, you will be in the firing line for, uh, for reputational damage and indeed risk. Remote servicing and diagnostics can help reduce site visits. And I appreciate that some installers prefer to visit um, to upsell equipment, but in lockdown, remote always wins. Sensationalist stories you may have heard about 2G and 3G. Um, the, the problem with these, 2G and 3G do carry mandated emergency uh, response services, uh, as well as 20%, they still carry 20% of call traffic. But this means that these networks aren't um, being switched off or shut down, they're being scaled back. So uh, re really check, check the facts before you, uh, you immerse yourself in any uh, 2G, 3G um, um, scaremongering. We have the answers to overcome any objections you have. And in the next part of this webinar, we'll be going through those. The second topic is fire. Fire monitoring is way behind security with just 5% of properties being monitored for fire. But fire has a 95% alarm rate. So even with 5% of properties monitored, the false alarm rate is 95%. So there's a lot of fire can learn from security in this. New standards and legislation, such as the Fire Reform Act, amazingly, that was 15 years ago, and latterly EN54, means that fire is being taken way more seriously. Not to mention confirmation proposals that have been put forward by the Chief Fire uh, Officers Association, or SOFOA. 67% of fires occur when premises are closed. We believe that key holders at least should be dispatched to confirm these fires, even if um, fire brigades aren't attending sites due to false alarms. John will be covering this in more detail later. The third topic is retail. Uh, retail seems to have always had challenging times, but these really have challenged it uh, beyond the beyond almost to the brink, I would say. Uh, but again, there is opportunity there. I think if retailers change, then there's opportunity for them to reopen and so on. Installers should adapt to a new way of working. Retail, as I say, not known for its financial buoyancy, does face huge challenges, but new rules and procedures really just center around social distancing. Our sector already has the tools needed to provide um, very effective social distancing um, using technology, not frontline people, as I've said before. People counting, thermal imaging for temperature, and deep learning video ana analytics via CCTV for people density, for example, not to mention access control and all our other uh, very high-tech products that we're very proud of within our industry and we take almost for granted. But autonomous, robust communications is the key. CSL have already provided thousands of comms solutions for these. 
So these are some of the challenges. I'm now going to hand over to CSL's John Coleman, who will fit solutions to each of these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for uh, attending today's webinar. As Simon has already introduced, I'm going to give you a, a further insight into BT All IP. I'm going to give you insight into EM54 and then talk about some of the connectivity challenges before handing over to uh, David Davies from DBF, who's got DBS going to do some live demonstrations. So first of all, just to talk about All IP, uh, quite simply, All IP is OpenReach's plans to switch off the PSTN network as we know it today. Um, and do that by December 2025. So the best way for me to explain this is to relate it to your own property. So in your own property, you're gonna have a master socket that looks something like this. And into your master socket, you would plug in your phone and you would plug in your broadband. So that's what most people have in domestic and commercial installations. As we move over to all IP, what's going to happen is we're all gonna get a new faceplate for this master socket. And then the only thing that will plug into the new master socket is a new router that will be provided by the telecoms provider and anything else that requires any kind of connectivity, phones, Sonos, PlayStations, security systems will have to connect to the new router and the router is connected to the new master socket. So phone calls, for example, would now be voice over IP as opposed to using the traditional PSTN that we've got today. So the plan switch off is December 2025. The mass migration will start in 2022, but there are a couple of key trials that have just started. The first trial is in Salisbury. Salisbury is really interesting because in Salisbury, in 25,000 domestic and commercial premises, they're actually taking fibre to the front door. So there'll be no copper connectivity whatsoever in Salisbury. It'll be fibre from the premises through to the exchange. The other trial that's taking place is in Mildon Hall, which is in Suffolk. And what they're going to do in Mildon Hall is they're going to keep the copper that you have in your house today and that copper will go to a green cabinet on the street. What they'll then do is they will disconnect that copper from the current cabinet and they will reconnect the copper to a new fibre cabinet. So you'll have copper from your house to the cabinet and then fibre going through to the exchange. So the network that we're going to have is going to look very different to what we currently have today. And this is just a brief roadmap of what things are going to look like. So what we see here is that OpenReach are going to launch their uh, broadband only services in March 2020. This is really important now is they're going to withdraw PSTN from sale in October 2023. The reason why this is important is we know that PSTN is going to get switched off in December 2025. We know we're going to start migrating people in 2022, but they're still going to sell PSTN new connections. Uh, they're going to switch off the PSTN network totally in December 2025. So then we'll look at BT. BT uh, have launched their broadband only service um, at the end of last year, beginning of this year. And it's now going to be, uh, voice will be voice over IP. This next part is quite important, is that the BT hub, the new router that BT will provide, will have the ability to support some PSTN devices. So this is the, the CSL router. This isn't the router that you'll get from BT, but this is the best way for me to explain what that PSTN uh, support looks like. So what will happen is that when you get the new router from the telecoms provider, if, if they provide it, it, it will have a PSTN analog switch on the back. So what that means is you could take, for example, a PSTN dualcom device, and you could connect the PSTN terminals of the dualcom unit to the PSTN port that's on the back of the router. or you can connect the IP side of the dual com to the back of the router. But at some point, the industry will have to go to their ex existing dual coms and either connect the PSTN terminals to the new router or the IP path to the new router. So we've obviously got a challenge there as to what we would do with that. Uh, Sky and Talk to Talk haven't announced any plans as to what they're going to do as of yet. KCOM over in Hull, they're going to commence this year. And Virgin Media will roughly follow the same as what BT do. The next part is really important. So Ofcom are fully supportive of the switch to all IP. And I think this has been demonstrated over the last few months is many of us are now having to work from home. That's putting extra strain on that broadband connectivity. The likes of Netflix and Amazon are stopping people watching in, uh, in 4K and in, high, in HD and it's now just standard definition because they have to manage the amount of bandwidth that we're getting within to our homes. So I believe that the drive to move over to all IP will now happen a lot quicker because we need to be able to provide 
that uh, reliable connectivity within those broadband services. And what's also very important here is consultation on copper closure has now commenced between Ofcom and Openreach. So what that basically means is that if any signaling product that relies on copper to go from the premises to the exchange, once copper is closed, that will no longer operate correctly. So the two key challenges that we see here are digital communicators, of which there are 800,000 digits installed, not just in security systems, but in fire alarms, in ward and call systems, in, in the healthcare marketplace, even lift alarms. When you're in a lift and the lift breaks down and you press the button, in many cases, that's connected to a digital communicator. So when we move to the All IP platform, it's unlikely that those digital communicators will work as the same with some of those legacy products that rely on that copper infrastructure. And this is where the real opportunity is, because as a wider industry, we need to address those signaling devices that won't work on the all IP platform. So at some point, we need to advise our customers that we're going to move them onto the latest technology. But the real opportunity, I believe, that comes here is that we know we need to swap out these devices at some point between now and potentially 2022. But the real opportunity is that we as a wider industry need to ensure that as many of our security systems are now set up for upload, download, remote service and diagnostics, because we need to be able to demonstrate to business owners, to end users, that we can continue to maintain their security systems remotely. That could be one remote maintenance a year and one physical visit a year, the ability to emit zones, uh, change user codes, etc. So by replacing the old technology, digital communicators, the old legacy products that rely on copper technology, not only do we give our end users the latest technology, but panel dependent, we also get them set up for being able to provide upload, download, remote service and diagnostics. So just a couple of the options that we've got here. So for the digital communicators, the 800,000 of them, we've got the DigiAir Pro. We discussed this in the, uh, in the Pro webinar we did a couple of weeks ago. Fantastic product, so radio only, using 4G, 3G and 2G technology, but it also comes with two roaming SIMs, so an active roaming SIM and a standby roaming SIM. And just to, to explain that, we do often get asked about having two roaming SIMs. Every roaming SIM belongs to a network provider. And if you get a localised issue, then that SIM card will roam onto another master or another, or another network. But if the company that owned that SIM, so Tele2, for example, if they had a core network outage, that could impact the ability for that SIM to get permissions to roam. So what we do on the single path solution is we now include a failover SIM. So this is a great opportunity to upgrade those digital communicator customers onto DigiAir Pro using 4G, 3G and 2G, all the latest technology. But depending on what panel you're installing it onto as well, you now get remote connectivity to that intruder system so that you can carry on to support your customers should we have any challenges in the future with uh, obviously restrictions and lockdown. The second option that we've got when we look at some of the legacy systems that operate at a higher grade is we've now got the dual radio option. So again, exactly the same piece of hardware. But what we do is we introduce a second 4G module with its own roaming SIM on a completely separate and diverse roaming platform. So we've now actually got three roaming SIMs uh, all, all working on different networks and diverse platforms. And this would be an ideal replacement for any of those legacy systems, as I say, that, that operate at a higher level to what digital communicators do. As a company, CSL have been dealing with installers on these uh, upgrade programmes for over a decade now. We've worked alongside hundreds of installers. And the one thing I would strongly recommend would be to speak to the relevant salesperson that looks after your area so that we can cover in more detail some of the processes that we put in place to support you doing these upgrades and again just to reiterate is at some point we need to replace these older systems because they will not work on the new all ip platform so speak to your csl salesperson and we can cover this in more details we can help you with the scheduling and also help put together any letters that you may want to send through to your end users so the next thing i'd like to move on to now is uh, all ip is on sorry is on uh, em54 So Simon mentioned it before, when we look at fire signaling, only 5% of fire alarms have some form of monitoring, yet 67% of fires occur when the premises are closed. And it's such a bizarre stat. And you think in the current restrictions and the current lockdown, all these business owners being away from their premises now, the businesses are locked, is that you would think as a minimum, you'd want to know if your fire alarm had a fault or there was a fire. 
Um, so it's really, really important that we, as an industry, work to get as many systems as we can onto some form of monitoring. But when we look at fire, we do get a couple of challenges. First and foremost, we've got the, um, the, the insurance companies who differentiate between protecting against property and protecting against life. So there isn't really the same amount of drivers there is in the intruder marketplace. But the other challenge and what we've seen over the last few years is that the cost of uh, signal in for EM54 can sometimes be cost prohibitive. So there's not really been that drive to get as many fire systems onto monitoring is what I believe there should be. And again, just a reminder on that stat, only 5% of fire alarms have monitoring, yet 67% of fires occur when the premises are closed. So what we've done, we've taken this feedback on board and what we've done with that is we've taken the Dualcom Pro again and we've now taken it through to what we call its EM54 accreditation. So what we have introduced within the Pro range are two new additions. So we've now got DigiAir Pro Fire EM54 Type 1. So again, this exactly the same piece of hardware that you would use on your intruder systems now has EM54 accreditation. So you can now do single path, DigiAir Pro Fire. If you wanted to relate this to intruder signaling, it's actually classified as an SP3. So it's got to send a path fail in just 31 minutes. So it's a single path device, two roaming sims, and we notify of a pole fail within 31 minutes. But the most important thing on this, as I've mentioned, is that you can now connect up channel one for fire, channel two for fault. So if premises are closed and there's an issue with that fire alarm, at least we can send some form of notification through to the monitoring station and subsequently through to a, um, to a key holder. The other option that we've got on the fire range is the Greater Pro Fire, again, EM54 Type 1, and that's used in radio, radio, so the two 4G radio modules. If you wanted to relate it to intruder signaling, it would be classed as a DP2, single path failure in 31 minutes and a catastrophic failure in, um, in 31 minutes. Again, I think the real opportunity when we look at EM54 are all the properties at the moment that are unmonitored. And the real opportunity I see is with the DigiAir Pro EM54. Again, we've got some really good letters, some really good marketing, what we can provide you with. And because I believe that we've all got an opportunity to write to our non-monitored fire customers and offer them some form of, of entry level monitoring. And that entry level will be with DigiAir Pro EM54. The final thing I'm going to talk about is the uh, change in requirements for connectivity. And once I've done this part here, I'll hand over to, uh, to David at DVS who would do the live demo. But many of the inquiries we've been getting recently are a little bit different when it comes to connectivity. Previously, people have been asking us to, to be able to view CCTV, et cetera. But what the current restrictions have shown us and what the easing of uh, lockdown has uh, now moved to is that retailers and business owners will need to be able to demonstrate that they have some form of, um, of social distancing, that they can demonstrate store occupancy. So the two main things that we've been getting inquiries on is first of all, thermal cameras, which David's going to demonstrate. But the second one, which is quite exciting really, is to do with people counting. So many of these cameras and CCTV applications today already have the ability to manage people counting and store occupancy. And what will happen as we move into this new era is that people based on the size of the building will have a store capacity. So let's say the store capacity is for 50 people. Is the cameras will be able to count how many people are coming in and how many people are going out. And once it reaches store capacity, there's the ability to close the doors, to send alerts to um, store managers, to HR, uh, to health and safety, etc. But the one challenge that we've got is that we need to deploy these solutions instantly. And I'm sure we've all had that challenge where we try to get onto the IT network, but to put it bluntly, we have to jump through hoops and these ports that need opening and firewalls, et cetera. So the big opportunity for our industry is on being able to provide instant connectivity for these things such as people counted and thermal cameras, et cetera. And the main benefit of the CSL router is that you can order this today and you can deploy it tomorrow and you can utilize what I believe will be a big influx of inquiries for people having to adhere to, you know, demonstrating that social distancing and uh, store occupancy requirements. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to hand over to David Davis, who's going to give you more of an insight into what we can do using the CSL router for that connectivity. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And um, thank you, CSL, for invite, inviting me to come on to uh, show these solutions. And as um, John alluded to, I have a CSL router plugged in and working here. Um, actually, 
we've seen a big upsurge in people asking for this uh, router technology. As John said, with the social distancing uh, people counting store solution that we can now provide, um, especially for multi-store uh, interconnectivity where they're managed from a central location. It's been very um, apparent that IT departments are already overwhelmed um, with their current workload with people working from home and they don't really want you on their network. Um, it can take a long time to do anything. So we found a really quick way of doing that is deploying the CSR router technology to connect these technologies together in real time and allow for a very secure and stable connection. So three of the systems that we're sort of seeing a big surge in is the thermal screening solution, which I'll show you, I'll just share my screen and we should be able to see this in action actually. Share, hopefully you can see my screen here. So this is one of the solutions that we're seeing deployed and linked to the CSR router. This system is actually connected via the CSR router. At DVS we use a CSR router to monitor our system to an ARC. It gives us a much more stable and secure connection to an ARC. So a lot of our system technology is monitored uh, via their technology and appreciate that it is very good. Um, if I go and stand in front of it, one of the benefits of this technology is to provide a mass screening solution for those entering a workplace, for instance, to allow you to identify by temperature, risen body temperature, skin surface temperature, that they could potentially be an issue and then second or third line screening can be deployed to either yay or nay them on the site. So it's a, a sort of a, an automatic mass screening solution. So if I stand in front of it and it should show you um, briefly what this sort of does. So hopefully you can see it capturing my face. I don't have a mask on. So again, if the government went down the line that they needed to enforce uh, the wearing of masks, we can actually identify that within our technology and then prompt a guard security or people on site that, that a mask isn't being worn. And again, you can go and head that off very quickly and easily and conveniently. Um, it's got very a lot of automated messaging, whether it's through the app, email, software, or like you said, you know, through this interactive screen. And again, if I look at one of the ones I did earlier, that was a, 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 an alarm that showed my body temperature was too high. Um, I am holding a glass of hot water before any of you um, worry that I might be ill, a glass of hot water. So we've, we've triggered the alarm to show that there is a potential issue. And again, that we can intervene and, and try to keep the site running and the people on there safe. So this is just one of the many solutions that we're seeing deployed via the CSR router technology. And again, this is connected through that technology. A couple of the other technologies that we've touched on, I'm just gonna bring up my team viewer, is this uh, social distancing system. Now we can do this through one store deployment up to multiple store deployment, and it can be centrally man managed through the CSR router technology or individu individually managed at a store level. Now these routers are very quick and easy to deploy and very cost effective. Now we can deploy this technology, set up the system and give the customer that safety that they feel will allow them to operate the store within the social distancing boundaries. Now this might take me sort 15 seconds to, to sort of run as fast as I can but the idea is you're so a green GUI to show that you are allowed in the store and you can set the store threshold to whatever the store is so if it's a big store and it's say 50 people 20 people a thousand people whatever that may be multiple entrances can all be managed from the same system so it works in coherence with each other and again when the when the store occupancy is reached all of the screens will turn red and then when somebody leaves or people leave it will turn green until it is reaches max maximum occupancy again, and then all of the reporting around that can be automated. So daily, weekly, monthly, they can be sent to a central location. And it also gives you a very good indication, not of how many people are in the store to keep that social distance where possible, but it actually gives you a good footfall counting. So it allows the store to see not only uh, how many people uh, get coming into the store to see if they're trading well or just browsing also what times they're busy. So do they need to adjust that stuff in time period? So I'll just quickly run and demonstrate this. I'll be very, very quick, I promise. Okay, so that hopefully worked. So again, a very quick and easy system to deploy. And again, backed up with their technology is fantastic. One of the other systems that we're seeing a lot of currently is 
not just thermal temperature screening, but thermal applications using CSR router technology to combine systems for remote monitoring. Again, this is our compound here, monitored to an arc via the CSR router technology. But given the current climate where a lot of sites are closed, but they want that additional monitoring to protect the site, this makes it a very easy sell to give the customer a very quick and easy way of monitoring and connecting an existing or a new system up to an arc with very little time on site, because obviously you can be in and out, and that comfort that you can uh, have that secure connection, but also the reliability that they've built into the CSR. Uh, technology so many many uses and again some of our salespeople are even using these to actually connect into the office because it's faster than their uh, rural broadband so I'd say there's definite use for home usage as well for emails so again that's all I wanted to touch on so hopefully you know you've uh, you've all learned something let's say thank you uh, David, if you could just unshare your screen, that would be great. Yeah, do that. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for this. Some great insights. Thanks to Dave and John for their, uh, for their segments there. Um, some great insights, and we hope that this will inspire you within your business. The fire and security sector has always held a vital role uh, in uh, public safety. And I believe this is our sector's opportunity um, to expand our services beyond traditional access, fire, uh, security, and CCTV. The Q&A will continue online, so, so please respond, uh, uh, pl please ask any questions and we'll respond to your questions even after the webinar's finished. Uh, and there will be a short um, poll uh, appearing, so please complete this. We will automatically follow up with more information via email, but please let us know if we can help further. Thank you for joining us uh, today, and I hope everybody found it valuable. Thank you.